up, everyone? This is Wade from Wrath and Grace Radio, and today we've got a special treat for you, especially those of you who couldn't make our last conference, uh, and so today you're going to hear one of those sessions. A uh, special shout out to our sponsors, Logos Bible Software, Kepler Education, and Magathy Payments. We hope you enjoy. Coming close to the end, again, thank you all for being here. It's been, a, it's been awesome meeting a lot of you. I've seen a lot of you online on, uh, on our Facebook page and interact with many of you, and uh, that's always a treat. But to get to meet you face-to-face is really, really awesome. So um, I did want to, um, for those of you who uh, have come here and this is your first interaction with Wrath and Grace, um, to let you know that there, we, we work hard Um, at producing quality content for you to help you grow in your Christian life and uh, want to encourage you to subscribe to our podcast. And uh, we try to um, have two episodes a week for you, one of them um, some uh, biblical content on a certain topic and then another episode a little bit shorter dealing with current events uh, of that week from a Christian perspective. So Uh, We'd like to encourage you to subscribe. If you really like the show and you want to help support it, we have uh, Patreon supporters who get extra content, and uh, we're making some big changes that are exciting coming up here in the next few weeks, and so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, We we very much appreciate that. And if you have ideas for the show, things you want to hear about, uh, we're always happy to take those as well, so please pass those along. Well, yesterday, as we spent our time with uh, Dr. Bodhi, we were looking at 2 Timothy 4, and we're going to go back to 2 Timothy today, but we're going to be in chapter 1 this time as I address the topic on the relationship between the Apostle Paul and Timothy called Like Father, Like Son. And I love what we heard yesterday with regard to the pastoral epistles on the whole and the necessity for us uh, to look at those by God's design for the church, uh, for the church, which is very different than looking to the book of Acts to find out how we are supposed to do things, uh, and as we were uh, reminded yesterday, that the call is not to uh, just go and do like we would think the first century church did. We heard great wisdom about that, very helpful. I actually saw a church in a small town in Georgia one time I was passing through, and it was called Corinth Baptist Church, and I was rather surprised because as we heard yesterday, that church was, and I quote Dr. Vody Balcom, tore up from the flow up. <laughs> it doesn't sound the same coming from me, I understand. <laughs> It doesn't make a lot of sense to name your church after probably the most notorious jacked-up church in all the Bible, but nevertheless, uh, there it stands. So we need the wisdom of the pastoral epistles, especially with regard to the subject matter that we've been looking at this weekend. So we're going to keep looking at 2 Timothy. Well, when Nick Alford and I had discussions about what we were going to write about in the book In Praise of Old Guys, one of the things we talked about was the, um, especially in the 90s, the Christian motivational posters that you can buy at Christian bookstores. They hang next, right next to the Thomas Kincaid paintings, and, and that's just down from the table where you can buy your Evangel Cube and your Testaments, your Christian breath mints. <laughs> the posters usually have something like like horses galloping or vast landscapes of of mountains and a sunset. It's all perfectly summarized by a verse or two of Scripture. And it's the sort of thing, um, I think Nick said this to me, he said, it's sort of the thing that your great aunt shares on Facebook. If you don't share it ten times, then the Lord is very displeased with you. Now, one of the posters we both recalled from our childhood, and I think that he said he had it hanging on his wall, was the picture of the Blue Angel jets flying together through the sky in perfect formation with the caption of Isaiah 40:31, and it says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. And there's something informative about what's being communicated there, isn't it? More specifically, I think we should say what's not being communicated there. Isaiah 40, 31 is a beautiful statement about how the Lord will sustain and redeem His faithful people, and yet 
What a lot of people don't do is read the verse that comes just before it, the one that sets the stage, that helps us to understand the necessity of God's promise. Verse 30 says, even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Now, why do you suppose Scripture utilizes youths specifically as an illustration of man's dependence upon God? Because youths have this sort of energy and enthusiasm that can carry us a lot further than most. And yet, we're reminded that even the young shall faint and grow weary without the sustaining grace of God in their lives. Certainly, youthfulness has its perks, but there's also a warning for those who pay close enough attention. Take care lest your youthful vigor carry you further than wisdom warrants. So here's our suggestion. We want to suggest a Christian poster, if we must have them at all. Maybe Wrath and Grace can print this one. I don't think the Christian bookstores will. We need a poster, and it's a bunch of young men full of the sort of energy and vigor which youth allows. But instead of them being the focus in, in, in running a track event or playing football uh, represented by blue angels in the sky, they're sitting humbly and quietly at the feet of a gray-haired saint with wrinkles, listening intently as he shares with them the wisdom and experience that they could never claim themselves. So in the context of 2 Timothy and Paul's relationship to this young pastor, I think about these things in light of Paul's words because it's here in this second letter that he has written at the end of his time on the earth. Paul's two letters to Timothy offer a tremendous amount of insight into the relationship that these two men shared. The first letter is a manual of sorts on how to conduct matters within the local church elders, deacons, preaching, it's all in there, and the evangelical church should pay a lot more attention to what is written in that letter, and a lot of messes that we encounter would be cleared up. Now, Paul's second letter to Timothy is his final correspondence, calling him to continued faithfulness to the king and his kingdom. We saw this briefly yesterday. This is Paul at the end of his life probably his last letter that he wrote. He knows he's about to be executed. So we have the wise, gracious, humble apostle who is writing his final letter to a young pastor full of youth, full of vigor in the earliest days of his ministry. Now, Paul doesn't want Timothy to be an obnoxious trailblazer for the church. He wants him to be a model of ministry and a model for other gospel ministers, a model for Christians, a model that reflects what he has seen in previous generations, and particularly the Apostle Paul himself. And so Paul offers to Timothy some very sound wisdom, instructing him to keep his focus on a few main things as he moves forward without the continued mentorship of Paul, because he will soon be gone. So we're going to try and tackle the whole chapter. So let's look first at verses 1 and 2 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, by this point in time, things had grown incredibly difficult for the Apostle Paul. In his previous letter to Timothy, remember the circumstances were very different. Paul was, was traveling then in hopes of visiting Timothy in Ephesus, but now he's imprisoned and he's chained in Rome for a second time. Now, tradition suggests that Paul was in a certain prison in Rome that, if true, means that he was in a very dark, dismal, underground chamber that only had a very small hole in the ceiling that would let light in and let fresh air in. And that's how he's writing this letter. And in chapter 4, we saw that Paul already had his hearing in court. He knew full well that his time was up for execution, and he was lonely. Paul was lonely. Have you ever felt lonely as a Christian? Paul's only companion was Luke. Demas had abandoned Paul because he loved the world. Christinus had gone to Galatia. Titus was in Dalmatria. 
Have you ever thought that nobody understands, that you don't have anyone to talk to about what's going on in your heart, in your Christian life? And take note that in the midst of all that troubled Paul, he still had a great concern, not for himself, but for the churches, and most especially for Pastor Timothy, who he loved so dearly that he called him in verse 2 his beloved child. Things in Ephesus had become very difficult for the young pastor at this point in time. Several people had deserted the church. Some had deserted the faith altogether. Hymenaeus had to be excommunicated. He was off doing evil deeds. Have you ever felt like the church that you love and labor for is falling to pieces by some people that you have grown close to, that you've invested much of your time and energy into? Paul's alone. He's probably famished. He's cold. He hoped to see Timothy. He hoped to see John Mark, but it's unknown whether they made it to see him at all prior to his death. So Paul's situation was very serious, but notice he never turned away from his young protege, Timothy, who was very likely dealing with a lot of discouragements himself. We have every reason to believe that Timothy applied everything Paul wrote to him in the first letter concerning the operation of the church, but they were still attacking, uh, the, the false teachers were still attacking the church. The heretics were coming in to Ephesus, and more and more trouble was headed his way. Have you ever felt like you're doing everything that God wants you to do, and yet you still face what seems to be insurmountable difficulties? Have you ever had the temptation to change course, to jump ship, to do something easier? So there's a marked difference between Paul's two letters to Timothy. The first is a sort of manual. Remember, Paul said in chapter 3 of the first letter, I'm writing these things to you so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The kingdom of God is being established on, on the earth, and the apostle Paul is working to make sure it is set in proper order, that it is in under proper direction. But 2 Timothy, as we've already said, is Paul's final correspondence and he's calling Timothy to hold fast to the faith, the faith that he knows, the faith that he has been taught by the power of the Holy Spirit, not wavering from the pattern and good deposit that was entrusted to him. So Paul's second letter is very personal. It is filled with love and affection for Timothy. It is his last will and testament. John Calvin said it was written not merely in ink but in Paul's life blood. Now, we can discern that Paul intended this letter not only for Timothy, but for the entire church based on his introductory statement. He wouldn't have begun the letter with such a formal statement had it been written for Timothy alone. So while he's addressing the young pastor, he continues to identify for the church who he is and who he is uh, appointed to be to give the kind of instruction that follows. He writes that he was made an apostle by the will of God. And the instrumentality was by way of the gospel, which brings men into new life with Jesus Christ. But then he turns to Timothy, and with warm, tender-hearted affection, he blesses Timothy with a blessing of, of grace to bring him pardon, to bring him mercy, to lift him up in his overwhelming weakness, and peace to bring him reconciliation from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So surely, Timothy was encouraged by these words from the man who had given so much to this young pastor. Look at verses 3 through 5. He writes, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience. As I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. And so Paul gives thanks for young Timothy. He assures the pastor that he remembers him in his prayers night and day, but he pauses in the middle of his statement here. He likes to, Paul likes to pile statements upon statements, doesn't he? He says, he thanks God whom he serves with a clear conscience as his ancestors did. 
Well, nobody could ever accuse the Apostle Paul of giving himself over to public opinion or the latest church growth fads or philosophies or any, pursuing anything with personal ambition. He served the Lord God and no other. Therefore, he had a clear conscience. In the middle of his thanksgiving, Paul draws a line through previous generations, and this is important as we consider our theme. He inserts a personal tribute to his heritage of faith, and by doing so, he really establishes a parallel between himself and Timothy, doesn't he? In verse 5, he points Timothy to look to his ancestors. And who are they? His grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. But for Paul, he hadn't denied his Hebrew heritage by following Jesus Christ. Paul is covenantal. He knew that in becoming a follower of Christ, he fulfilled his heritage. He didn't replace it. And I think there's a lesson here for those of you who are who are mothers, maybe stay-at-home moms with your, with your children or, or your grandmother who watches over your grandchildren and spends significant amount of time with them. What you do in the lives of your children and grandchildren is very, very significant in the development of their spiritual lives. You are treasured. You are blessed. You are some of the greatest gifts that God has given to the church for our future generation. Don't take that lightly. That is a very important thing that you are called to do, and we see that very thing here in the life of Timothy. Now, I want to think just a minute through about uh, the heritage of faith that Paul identifies. He identifies it for himself and also for Timothy. Paul is sort of laying the foundation of faith upon which Timothy's own faith has been built. There's a godly line of older people here. Now, remember, Paul is sort of mentoring through the writing of this youthful pastor, undoubtedly full of ideas and zeal, but notice what Paul doesn't say. Paul doesn't say, be as creative as you can and do whatever it takes to get people to gather for your preaching. Paul is not encouraging Timothy to find his own way, to blaze his own trail, to chart his own course. Paul is showing Timothy that the way forward is for him to continue to build upon the foundational heritage that is already there. That's instructive for all of us, especially if we're parents. We have this role. We have this role of establishing a heritage of faith in our own homes and assisting others in a local church to do the same thing. There can be no doubt that there is a tremendous reward for those who diligently pursue the worship of Christ in their homes. In Him alone we find hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, so to neglect family religion is to neglect providing our posterity with the greatest gift that we can give to them, a thorough, rich knowledge of Christ which is so often the foundation upon which we see that they have faith and are built up in Christ in the future. When George Whitfield looked upon the Christian homes in his day in Savannah, I will let you know, he said was the most beautiful city in the world. And Travel and Leisure magazine just said the most beautiful city in the country. So take that to heart and come visit us. George Whitfield said, if it was ever seasonable for ministers to preach up or people to put in practice family religion, it was never more so than in the present age, since it is greatly to be feared that out of those many households that call themselves Christians, there are but few that serve God in their respective families as they ought. As for the primitive Christians, they had not so learned Christ as falsely to imagine religion was to be confined solely to their assemblies for public worship but on the contrary behaved with such piety and exemplary holiness in their private families that St. Paul often styles their house a church, and I believe we must forever despair of seeing a primitive spirit of piety revived in the world till we are so happy as to see a revival of primitive family religion. How much more could that be said of our day, that family worship has nearly died as a practice in our homes. If we're to understand anything of the theme on which we've preached all weekend, it is that this all begins in our homes. One of the reasons we looked last night at the fifth commandment, 
Now I praise God that he saw fit to save me and to give me a love for the Lord Jesus Christ and a knowledge of Christ upon which I am now charged to bring that to my children, that God might be pleased to take all that I'm, I'm hoping to pack in their lives to, to build up around their hearts. I want to put all this gospel kindling around their hearts. And so when the Holy Spirit may desire to come and set fire to that kindling, it'll be a massive blaze that can never be put out. Oh, that our homes would be, would be filled with so much more conversation and prayer and singing to and about the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in chapter 3, Paul mentions that Timothy has known the Scriptures how long? Since his childhood. Listen, parents, are, are we providing in our homes a foundation of faith that one day our children will say, with a clear conscience, I give thanks to God for the foundation upon which my faith is built? What do you think that foundation is? It's your faith. It's your faith in Christ that they themselves may one day have faith in Christ. Will their reputation be such that it can be said of them that they have known the Scriptures since childhood? I mentioned this yesterday. One of the things that goes on in a church like the one I pastor where there are a ton of young families is that we have a massive amount of babies. If they were zombie babies, all of the adults would be dead because there's so many of them. <laughs> but the thing… I, that's, that's quite a mental image, isn't it? <laughs> the thing is that most of us have children that are pretty young. A lot of them are really young. We only have a few families that have children that have grown up and moved out of the home and are in the church and have started their own families. We have a few, but we have far more new parents. But what I wanted when I was first a parent was for my wife and I to find some godly people with kids, and those kids are dynamite, and to go and ask them a bunch of questions. We observed their habits in their homes, and we just replicated stuff. If you're a new parent and you think you know what you're doing, you don't, you don't have a clue. Why are we always trying new stuff in parenting? I'm amazed they just let you. It takes longer to buy a car than to get a baby at the hospital and just go home. This is a, a human being, and you just walk home with them, and all of a sudden you're supposed to know everything. And so we need some wisdom, right? Why, why are we always trying things when you have some tried and true methods and practical wisdom and common grace has provided for us? For example, my, my wife and I immediately wanted to learn from a family that we knew. They have, they have seven children, and, and all of them are walking with Christ. But, but early on, I really wanted to know how they got them to go to sleep immediately and to stay asleep through the night. And listen, they had it down, and it was impressive. And so we said, how did you do it? We want to do that. And they talked to us over dinner one night. They gave us some pointers, and, and we were off. So we did what they told us for all three of our children, and all three of our children never slept in our bed, and were all sleeping through the night within the first six weeks of their birth. So now we tell young couples, hey, we learned this from someone else, and if you want to hear about it, we're happy to share our advice with you. We learned it from another family. It worked for them. It worked for us. It should follow that it may work for you. I'm thinking, you know, people like to sleep. And yet, we've talked to a lot of couples about this, and I don't think a single one of them has done it. And then six months down the road, at 3 a.m., they're on Facebook lamenting the fact that their kid still isn't sleeping through the night. Oh, don't do new stuff when old stuff works. The latest parenting fad isn't going to stick around. It's why it's called a fad. A lot of things your grandma did still work. We don't always need to clamor for the new. I want you to notice something else here. In between these statements calling us to see a strong heritage of faith between Paul and Timothy, we see in verse 4, at the last time Timothy and Paul were together, Paul had to leave, and Timothy wept. 
It seemed to be a profound loss for Timothy. Undoubtedly, it was, it was probably, he was probably fairly certain, and, and it was to both of them, that this was the last time they would see one another. Imagine that. His father in the faith, the man at whose feet he sat, wouldn't be with him any longer. He had to do this on his own. He wouldn't be there to answer his questions, to provide him wisdom for the way forward when things went south. And Paul uses this occasion to speak words of encouragement and affirmation into Timothy's life. Like a father for his son, Paul sensed Timothy would need encouragement. He would need that encouragement given all that he was going to encounter, all that he was encountering. He wanted to strengthen him. But he also knew this wasn't a one-sided relationship. Seeing Timothy would be a blessing to Paul as well. He would be filled with joy. And I want to assure all of you here who are, who are older, your fitly spoken words to a young man or a young woman in your church who's seeking to be faithful in the Christian life, those are not spoken in vain. Encourage the young people in your church and develop relationships with them that are so strong that there's a deep longing for the both of you to be with one another. You know, most of the people in your churches who are from my generation, the forgotten generation, Gen X, everyone talks about millennials and baby boomers. They forgot we exist. The 90s really happened. <laughs> All of us grew up with baby boomer parents and some of you are of that generation, a lot of baby boomer parents parented out of guilt trying to free their children from the shackles of the past. And that means a lot of us grew up in homes that had nothing to do with the church at all. So if you find people in your church who are in their 30s and pushing into their 40s, there's a good likelihood that they didn't grow up in a church and they don't have a home where things were being instilled from uh, a young age. It's just not very common. They need you. You want to be that person. When something goes down in their life, when, when they face trials, when they need counsel, when they have their first child, or when they get in their first fight with their spouse, intense fellowship. The first person that they can think to call or text is probably you, not their mom or their dad. They don't know Christ. Do you have people like that in your life? Now, throughout this chapter, Paul's going to identify at least five different marks in Timothy's life that are necessary for him to be faithful, to continue to persevere in the faith, building upon the foundation that was already laid for him. One of those marks is right here in verse 5, and is that Timothy has a faith that is free from hypocrisy. Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith without hypocrisy. This is why Paul had such high hopes in Timothy's service. He knew it was a real thing. His faith in Christ was genuine. It was free from hypocrisy. It was the real deal, and it was shown through his faithfulness and no doubt the continued evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in his life. There's no question whether or not the faith is alive and well in Timothy in Paul's mind. It's there. It's genuine. This is a person whose countenance is different, and you see them in time living less and less upon themselves and living more and more upon the righteousness of Christ. That's when you see a genuine faith that is free from hypocrisy. And so that was the first mark. The second one, we see, uh, we see five total. Let's, let's read first, though, verses 6 through 12. Paul continues, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, His prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. 
but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that He is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Well, Paul is continuing to identify the marks of perseverance as a man who did it himself and is now leading a younger man to continued faithfulness. And he identifies in verse 6 that Timothy has a heart for ministry. This is the second mark. Now, let's be honest. For guys who are in ministry, there will be times when we are down and we think, isn't there something else I could be doing with my life? Something with less stress, something a bit less emotional, something more appreciated. (laughs) There are times when we aren't vigilant and we begin to question our love for the ministry, and there are times, those those times when we we need to lean forward a bit and, and press on with God's help. I used to be a marathoner, and usually during the race there was a point in which I had the thought, what am I doing right now? (laughs) <laughs> Why did I pay for this? <laughs> but then, the thought has to transition if you're going to make it. The thinking has to change. There has to be a reminder of the prize, the goal, the finish line. What did we hear before? Remembering our Creator, striving toward the end, remembering that heaven awaits The pain, the suffering, the angst, the struggle, it's all for our good. But all in all, a man who perseveres in the ministry, a Christian who perseveres in the faith, that is a man, that is a woman who has a heart for Christ. And Paul tells Timothy that he wants to see him continue to fan the flame of ministry zeal. He wants to set him ablaze with a passion for the ministry, giving himself to the study and preaching and teaching of God's Word and the shepherding of souls. This wasn't a gift given to Timothy through Paul's laying on of hands. That's, that's not what verse 6 is implying. It's that Timothy was given that gift from God, and it was confirmed through others. God gave the gift, and God's people confirmed it through the laying on of hands. Now, I still like to think of myself as a youngish pastor, although I realized I was the second oldest on the platform up here before, which makes me feel a little bit older. I'm not new. I've I've got 13 years of ministry under my belt, and 12 of those are at the same church. I'm not, I'm not an old guy yet, but something that just blows my mind. Many churches in our community around us, they're used to seeing new pastors every five to seven years, and that's probably the same in your community, maybe in your own church. I'll tell you, in my own county, it's not that large, but it's the south, so there are 75 churches in our community, in our county, and there are only two other men who have been pastoring their churches longer than I have. Seventy-five churches, three of us longer than seven years in our county. That's astounding. When things get hard, what is our tendency? To run away to greener pastures. Sometimes the pastures are greener because the grass is over the top of a septic tank. It's, it's, not always, it's not always wrong to go to another church, but it's not necessarily going to be easier. It's not always wrong to go to another church or into another type of ministry, but why are we quitting? We have to answer that question. Same thing with church members. Listen, why is it that things sometimes get tough in a relationship and we're struggling with another person or another couple or our pastor says something we don't like? That you think it's just better to go down, to the ro- down the road to the next church. That's not just immature. That's shameful and that's sinful. The difficulties in your church that you will encounter are actually gifts from God. God makes things difficult in the local church sometimes for your sanctification, and so that you will be forced to work on a relationship with someone that you have held at arm's length. They're there for you. I tell our congregation all the time, I'm sorry, but you need me, and I need you. We're in this together, but we have to live together for all eternity, so we should probably start working this out now. (laughs) 
And feeling sorry for ourselves doesn't work. Calling another disgruntled church member you know who is equally discouraged to complain to one another about whatever the situation is, that's not going to work. You know what you should do? You should go to that godly older saint who's been at your church so long that they can tell you what it was like back before the building had an air conditioner and ask them, listen, I have this issue and I need your counsel so I can persevere in supporting and loving and being faithful to my local church. How have you done it all these years with all of these people? I bet they're going to have some really godly wisdom. I had a period of time, it's been quite a few years ago now, things were tough in our church. I got depressed. I really didn't know that. I was, I, was, I was at a time I was ready to hang it up, and I had an older pastor at my house, and we were sitting on my back porch where all the best theology and life decisions happen late at night. And he said, Nick, you're depressed. And before you make any big decisions, settle your heart, ensure your communion with God is on solid ground, and then decide what is best to do. Don't make any decisions right now. And wouldn't you know it, I took his advice and realized the problem, like is so often the case, was a lot more about me than anyone else. I learned what Paul was teaching Timothy. We can persevere because we have been given the gift, the gift of a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. But the only way we can stir up the Spirit within us is through sustained communion with God. Do you remind yourself every single day of what God has accomplished for you in your redemption through Jesus Christ? Do you have a conscious reminder each and every day that God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son that you should not perish but have everlasting life? Nothing will stir our affections for Christ as much as a conscious pursuit of being reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ loves us. The second we take our eyes off of Christ, our hearts will go searching for other lovers. And so we must find ourselves in regular repentance, all the while reminding ourselves, all that Christ did, He did it for me. Now, we all know our communion with God will waver. Sometimes it'll be hot, sometimes it'll be cold. Sadly, at times it'll be lukewarm. That's why we need to fight. However, we need to be convinced that more heavenly joy is available to us than we ever thought could be obtained in this life. In His Word, God has set before us the riches, the enjoyment of God that we can have with our Savior in this life because we are united to Him. Our union with God will never be taken away, even though our communion with God may waver from time to time. Well, another mark that Paul lays out for us in verse 8, and, it, and, and it's this, that unashamed faithfulness, it's, it's that Timothy has an unashamed faithfulness to the Lord and to Paul. How do you persevere? You have an unashamed faithfulness to the Lord. And he adds himself here. So the, the first part is easy. What true minister of the gospel would be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ? There are certainly charlatans in this world. There are many of them. They blaspheme the name of Jesus by using Him for their own gain. They're truly ashamed of who Christ is. But no true faithful minister of the gospel is ashamed of Christ. However, there will be that temptation. Faithfulness to the gospel may lead to costly suffering. Paul wants Timothy to be prepared to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. Physically, socially, the Christian is called to be willing to give our very lives for the sake of Christ. So the temptation to be ashamed is there. And Paul says, don't be. Stand firm. Continue in unashamed faithfulness. But there's something else here that's interesting. Paul says that Timothy is also faithful to him. Now, you may think, How dare he put himself in the same category as Christ? Who does he think he is? Well, that's just the point, isn't it? He's a prisoner. Timothy, you are showing that you are unashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ by way of showing that you're unashamed of the least of his disciples in how you are unashamed of me who is a prisoner in his name. 
So you see, this isn't about Paul at all. This is still about the Lord Jesus Christ. But brothers and sisters, it it does lead us to think, what is your relationship to the least in your congregation or community? If, If you have church members who are so old and frail that they cannot even leave their homes, do you even know them? Or do you assume that your pastors and deacons will take care of them for you? Have you ever visited them? I guarantee you that they want to see you. They want a visit from you, and they want you to bring your children so they can see them too. If your life is so busy with everything else that you can't give an hour to go see a dear brother or sister in Christ in their home, you need to change your priorities. It will be better for you than it is for them. I guarantee it. But what about those people who are marginalized, the most difficult and awkward people in your fellowship? We all have some of those people. We all know the kind. If you don't think you have those people in your congregation, they're in every congregation, so… They're difficult to deal with. But they're God's people. They're God's people. How do we relate to them? Are you ashamed of them? Then Paul says, if you're ashamed of them, you're ashamed of Christ. In as much as you've done to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. And unashamed faithfulness leads to our, our bringing our arm around the least and lowest who belong to Christ, even if they're socially awkward and difficult to talk to and hard to hang out with. Love them. Pour into them. Give your life to them. The fourth mark that the Apostle Paul points to in verses 9 through 12 is it is a life of holiness, a life of holiness. Paul reminds Timothy in verse 9 that we are called to a holy calling, and then he goes on to outline a few of the basic elements of the gospel. It seems to me that when Paul writes, and he's reflecting on all of these things, that he never gets far from the gospel. And in this particular instance, it's tied up with a life of holiness. We are called to holiness, and we can live holy lives when we have been transformed by the gospel, which has been manifest for us in Christ Jesus. He has saved us. He has called us to a holy calling, not in our own doing, but because of what Christ has done. And you know, I think if Timothy was anything like me, he needed an older man telling him, watch yourself, Timothy. Set holiness as your highest aim in life. Keep pursuing holiness. Don't back away from a life of holiness. Robert Murray McShane once said, it's not great talents that God blesses, but great likeness to Jesus. Listen, this isn't so much about who we are when we are at church fellowships or visiting people in their homes. This is more about who we are when we're all alone. The door is shut, nobody's around. Who are you then? What's the voice in your head then? Is your life marked by holiness? Do we live lives of holiness before God in public just as much as we do when nobody's watching? Are we the same person in our churches as we are in our homes? The writer of Hebrews gives us a very sober reminder in chapter 12. He says, pursue holiness, for without holiness no one will see the Lord. This is the mark of a true Christian who will persevere in fanning the flame of faithfulness in Christ Jesus, recognizing that communion with God is inseparably linked with the pursuit of holiness. It's wisdom for the ages. Listen, talking about holiness, it's not sexy, it's not cool, it's not trendy, it's not radical but it honors and pleases God, and it brings us to a place of humility in which we're called to depend on God all the more. That's where true communion with God is found, desperate and hopeless on our own, forced to die to ourselves that we might live upon another. Well, the fifth thing Paul points out to Timothy in verses 13 and 14 is that he is to guard the deposit. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. 
He calls him to remain grounded in the truth and have a love for the truth of God's Word. Follow the pattern, guard the deposit. The pattern is a pattern of sound words, a pattern of life-giving words. Paul emphasizes this because he has seen how rapidly and how easily false teaching is spread. There were in their day numerous false ideas, just as there are today. Think of the vast amounts of people who listen to all of the nonsense out there today. As I mentioned before, I spend a lot of time each year in the country of Nigeria. I've been going there for a decade now, and I am always brought to face once again the reality of how deplorable the false teaching is in that country of so many claiming to be Christians and not even knowing that they're not. But it's no different here at home. It's just on greater display there because it's on every billboard. But think of our charlatans who fill the airwaves who say very little that have to do with the truth and distort God's Word to appease the masses and to fill their pockets. The people are taken in mass, and they love it. And when they stop loving one false teacher, they'll move on to the next. But if you stop them and ask them, what is the gospel? You'll get blank stares, or you'll be called judgmental, or you'll be called a bigot. And so every young Christian especially needs this reminder to remain grounded because everything out there is clamoring for your notice. It can, be a temp- it can be tempting. It can be tempting. I get it. When your kid is the only kid in your church's youth group or whatever, it's tempting to look down the street at that big place that has a rocking band every Sunday, but their preacher, notice that The music's always live, but the preacher is okay to put on a flat screen TV. And to think, they've got hundreds of kids that are my kids' ages. We need to go there. And then you forget the reason that you went to that place that you're at right now in the first place. It wasn't because of the programs. It wasn't because of the show that gets put on each week. It was because the church is grounded and faithful in the truth. You know, I I can tell someone all that they want to hear. I can fill their minds with all the psychological studies and methods that I can find. I can make them feel good about themselves without ever addressing their sins. I can make them feel okay about their lifestyle. But I'm killing them if I do that. Putting a dagger in their heart. Listen, it's not hard to draw a crowd. If a curly-headed clown who blinks too much in Texas can draw a a crowd, then we can all do it. And we can do it bigger and better. He's proof of the world's mantra. Just believe in yourself, and if you try hard enough and stick to it, you can achieve anything. That's one of the biggest lies we teach our children. Sure. Maybe, granted, maybe, it's not true, but maybe, if you could achieve whatever you wanted to achieve, There's still one thing you can't on your own, and that is a likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ and a passage through the grave onto heaven. Listen, we don't need new methods. We don't need new programs. We don't need new laser light shows and fog machines. We certainly don't need a new message. We need the same old story of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and we need it played on loop in our hearts and in our churches over and over and over again. That's the good deposit of the saints of old, and the old saints and the young saints alike have all needed and will continue to need to hear it. And so Paul's call to all of us, let's not waver. Look to those who've gone before you because they know what it means to live daily upon Christ in holiness. Well, finally, verses 15 through 18, we read, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagelius and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphus. That's not how you say that, but whatever. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains, but when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Paul sort of ends this chapter with a few examples of what he's been talking about. We don't have time to delve into all of it, so I'll just give us a quick summary. In reality, Paul had been 
deserted by a substantial group of people. Certainly, everyone was not all the Christians in Asia, or else that would have included Timothy himself. But his point is clear. There are very few who would stand with the Apostle Paul, and he felt completely deserted. Among the defectors, Phygelius and Hermogenes, we don't really know anything about them, but, but Timothy obviously knew who, with, knew who they were, and he would be troubled by that news. Paul, having such a great heart, he had been slandered and deserted by people he loved. And consequently, he was brokenhearted by this. His implicit message to Timothy was, don't be like Phygelius and Hermogenes. Stand with me, suffer with me, keep the faith with me in the dark of this dungeon where neither the sun nor the moon shines. Stand with me, brother. But there were still faithful brothers, and that's an encouragement to all of us. Paul shares his thanks for those who encouraged him, those who were not ashamed of his imprisonment. He searched until uh, the, the, the one brother, uh, one nif- one. One Siphorus, that's what it is, one Siphorus. He searched until he found Paul. And then when he, when he found him, he visited him often, and he checked on him regularly. How wonderful that a man who was undoubtedly influenced by Paul's ministry was now turning around to serve the apostle in his distress. Young people, we've spent a lot of time talking about finding those who are older than us, and listening to them, and learning from them, and growing with them. But there may come a time when you have every opportunity in the world to turn and serve them. Take advantage of that. And that tells me again, we need each other. Young and old, short and tall, skinny and (laughs) big-boned, black and white and brown and yellow, let's not give up loving and serving and pouring our lives into one another. Let's be quick to reconcile our differences, to overlook offenses, to sharpen iron with one another instead of seeking to be a part of divisions. Let's continue to gather and standing faithfully in the sound words and the good deposit that's been taught and entrusted to us that we might carry on the very calling of young Timothy for the good of God's church and His glory to be a holy people pursuing the things of God. Well, as for Timothy, we have to ask, Did his youthfulness get the best of him, or did he take the sound wisdom of Paul and stand faithful to what he was called to? It's easy to miss, but we read it at the end of the book of Hebrews. It says, Timothy has been released. From what? Well, obviously, he wasn't released from taking his share of the sufferings in prison for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was faithful to the end. Timothy was faithful to the end to the end. He, was a, he had a faith free from hypocrisy. He had a heart for ministry. He had an unashamed faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the least of these. He lived a life of holiness. He remained grounded in the truth, and he had a love for God's Word. He wasn't a foolish young man, but instead he was found to be wise. I want to be like Timothy. I want to be like Paul because I want to be like Christ. Brothers and sisters, I hope on the last day that all of us will stand together, loving one another, having shared in the sufferings of Christ together while pursuing the unfading crown of glory, which will be ours should we persevere by the power of the Holy Spirit to the end. May God help us. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your sound, faithful Word to us your lowly servants, daily in need of grace, daily in need of mercy, daily in need of your continued patience with us as we seek to faithfully pursue Christ, as we seek to to put to practice all that we have looked at, all that we have talked about. Lord, help us to be faithful saints. Help us to die to ourselves that we might live upon Christ. Help us to honor the relationships that you've given us in our lives, not take them for granted, but to love your people, to love them well, 
to learn from them, to grow with them, to serve them as we are able, and to give glory to you for all the good gifts that you have provided for your church. We give you thanks, and we look forward to all of the great things that you will do as we seek to implement all that we have learned and talked about this weekend. It may be all to your glory and for the good and building up of your church. And we pray it all in Jesus' name.